Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, here in beautiful Secaucus, New Jersey, where I can basically see my apartment back in New York from here. Uh, It's just on the other side of the river from Manhattan, where I live, and I am participating in the World Series of Poker circuit event for the 2020 2021 season. This, I believe, is the uh, kickoff event for that season. So, as I'm recording this on Thursday, October 15th, yeah, that's right, I am uh, about to play in event number one of that series. I have no circuit rings to my credit. I have two circuit final tables. Um, I have no bracelets. I have some good caches, but I would like to get some jewelry. <laughs> so uh, we're here. We're going to try to make this happen on WSOP.com this week. But of course, I think about you guys all the time. And I wanted to be sure to put out a podcast today. So here we go. There's a lot happening in the uh, poker world. As most of you know, the big heads up challenge between Doug Polk and Daniel Negreanu is in full force, at least on Twitter. The guys are arguing about the terms of the match. And honestly, I think it's bizarre. Now, full disclosure, I've never met Doug in person, but I know Daniel, not that I can consider him like one of my bros or like my best friend or something, but Daniel and I have interacted and worked together on a number of occasions Uh, Notably with Matt Stout's excellent charity organization, the Charity Series of Poker, and in other avenues around the world. Without regard to that, I really don't have a horse in this race. I mean, I like to see good things happen for poker as a whole and for the poker community. I like to see attention being paid to the game and, you know, for all those reasons, I'm excited about the prospect of this heads-up match. One of the most watched videos ever on PokerGo was the uh, heads-up battle between Mike Dentale and Kate Hall. Heads-up grudge matches are great. Uh, Everybody loves, you know, heads-up for rolls. That's how we settle (laughs) our beefs. And don't know if you guys can hear this in the background, but apparently... My uh, neighbor here at the hotel in Secaucus is an opera singer. So I do have an opera singer next door. I feel like I'm still uh, home in my New York City apartment. Anyway, I was saying that there is a, a... Basically, Doug made a name for himself online criticizing more famous players. Uh, he went after Phil Helmuth. He went after Daniel Negreanu. This is kind of how he built his following to some extent. He's also an excellent, like maybe all-time Heads up, no limit player. So, uh, but even besides that, you know, the famous videos that he made where he pokes fun at Daniel and and kind of points out Daniel's various hypocrisies and things of that nature. And then there's also, of course, the the famous billboard, uh, morerakeisbetter.com or whatever, uh, that was hanging right outside the, uh, the Rio Hotel one year when we all went for the World Series of Poker in Las Vegas. So... Uh, The history is long and storied, and these two guys don't like each other. Daniel fights back sometimes on Twitter, taking the bait, I guess you could say, where Doug sort of goads him into getting upset, and then Daniel gets upset, and he retweets, and it's just, it's ugly, okay? But it's also entertaining for those of us on the sidelines kind of enjoying the match, so That's kind of where things stand. Uh, But the latest controversy is that Doug, for some reason, was insisting on being allowed to use a heads-up 
hand chart for pre-flop ranges, which, okay, number one, I, I don't know what you guys think, but I think that Doug Polk is a huge favorite in a heads-up match versus Negreanu. Now, that's nothing against Negreanu. Negreanu is obviously a terrific, you know, amazing poker player himself. But Doug Polk played so much heads-up, no limit. Like, this is his bread and butter for so long. This is how he made basically all of his income. Now, of course, as we all know, Doug has been retired for some time, and he's basically coming out of retirement for the purposes of having this knockdown, drag out, whatever you want to call it, heads up match against his bitter rival, Daniel Negreanu. Uh, this is a circus, okay? I love it. I think it's great for the game. Anything that makes people pay attention to poker. Uh, I think it's very silly, though, that Doug, who is such a favorite regardless, actually insists on having these pre-flop charts. Now, first of all, if you've ever seen a No Limit Hold'em solver uh, for a heads-up match, it's pretty easy to figure out pre-flop ranges and what to do. It's almost like trying to memorize a blackjack basic strategy chart. I'm pretty sure that Doug Polk should have this chart already committed to memory just based on the fact that he spent the last several months taking on all comers heads up on ACR and elsewhere. I even played him myself for a, a few hundred hands. And, uh, you know, he took me, we played, I think, 510 and he took me for just a couple hundred. So... Uh, but yeah, we didn't play enough hands to really say that that proves I'm anywhere near the no <laughs> heads up, no limit player that Doug Polk is. And that's not what I'm saying. So please do not flame me on Twitter. But uh, I decided to get involved and I do like playing heads up occasionally. So it was fun. And just knowing that I was kind of uh, playing my little role in helping him prepare or helping this match to actually happen. Uh, despite my friendship with Daniel, Daniel didn't ask me to play heads up with him. So uh, I was happy to jump on with Doug and just basically be a sparring partner for him. If you are a specialist like Doug was for so many years, playing against somebody like me, he's a he's a very big favorite against me. And he's probably almost as big a favorite against Daniel. Now, all that said, guys, when you're a favorite in a heads up match, that doesn't really mean that you're going to win. A heads up is a lot of luck. I don't know if they were trying to agree to play 20,000 hands or 30,000 hands. So, I mean, it wasn't like just like the couple hundred hands that I played with Doug because they want to try to limit that variance. But that said, there's no guarantee that Doug, being the favorite, will actually win the match. Um, I just think it's kind of a bad look for Doug, the way he's going after everybody on Twitter I mean, he went after Christian Soto, implying that Christian is broke or, or busto, as some like to say. Uh, and if that's true, it's kind of a cruel thing to attack a man for, in my opinion. Uh, and just kind of a schoolyard bully. Now, it's hard to imagine that Daniel, you know, one of the most accomplished poker players of all time, is being bullied on Twitter. But when, because they are specifically talking about a heads up, no limit cash game. I mean, that is Doug's bread and butter. Daniel has never professed to be the best heads up, no limit player in the world, right? And Doug said he was and could back it up for quite a while. He's kind of nerdy. He likes to analyze poker hands and use a solver and all of that stuff. So it's kind of silly that he wanted to use pre-flop charts in the first place. And so that's a sticking point right now. I mean, I do believe this match will happen but they've got to get together on what the terms of the match will be. But then we also get into the issue of RTA, which we discussed last week on this program. It stands for Real-Time Assistance. So look, Doug, you're already a huge favorite in this match, but now you want to tell me that you also want to be allowed to use assisting software, like Real-Time Assistance, and it just seems like Doug should just be willing to play him mano a mano as we say and it would be great if they could just agree to that and that would be more fun for people to watch i mean the viewers don't really want to watch you use uh, a supercomputer to figure out what the right play is or anything of that nature they want to see their favorite guy against their least favorite guy heads up for roles <laughs> so 
Uh, hopefully they'll work it out, but either way, it is definitely uh, a great source of entertainment. If you're not following on Twitter, you're really missing out. Uh, speaking of Twitter, I'm at Clayton Comic on Twitter, and although I might not be as controversial or notorious as a Doug Polk or a Daniel Negreanu, I hope that you guys, if you're not following me already, you will. And I love interacting with all of our podcast listeners, and this is not the first time I heard from Daniel Gogan. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but his Twitter account is Dango Poker. And Daniel writes, Hey, Clayton, love what you do on the podcast. Most people check to the razor, but I see a lot of donk bets at my local games. Should we implement the donk more? And what do you put people on who donk bet? Okay, now th these are really good points that Daniel's bringing up. I would like to talk about donk betting. Uh, the solvers that we all know and love, and this is like your PO solver, your card runners EV, like all the major solvers that basically can help you in heads up post flop situations based on pre flop ranges. These programs have concluded beyond a doubt that in heads up situations, you should pretty much always check to the razor. I don't even know why I said pretty much. The solver will tell you to always check to the razor when you're in a heads up situation and you are out of position. From a GTO standpoint, it is incorrect to donk lead when you only have one opponent. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that in the theoretical world, it's a mistake to do that. Now, if you have an opponent who is going to put you on a hand you don't have just because you donk lead into him, and maybe as a result, that opponent would make a big mistake, then by all means, throw the computer out the window and do what you think is going to be most profitable. That's what exploitative play is all about. But that said, unless you have that type of read, it's more profitable, it's been proven to be more profitable to check your full range in those heads up spots. Now lately, some more advanced solvers have been working on multi-way pots and the decisions that players face in them. And they have actually determined that GTO in a multi-way pot dictates a good amount of donk leading and that we don't do anywhere near the amount of donk leading that we should. So what I'm saying is if you're donk leading in heads up pots, you're probably making a mistake. If you're donk leading in multi-way pots, you're doing something that the solvers have learned that you should be doing and that none of us are doing enough of. Likewise, they said the same about over betting that these supercomputers have determined that overbetting is something that no one does enough. But since the question is about donk leading, let's talk about donk leading in multi-way pots. If I'm in either a heads up or a multi-way pot and I have uh, a, a recreational opponent, an amateur player who's having some fun and doesn't really study the game per se, typically I would put that opponent on a top pair type of hand or a draw. Most players like to donk lead with a medium strength non-monster range. So on a flop like king 7-4, an amateur opponent who donk leads into me probably has a king, maybe a king with not a great kicker, possibly has a, a different one pair hand, something like a7, or a draw, like if there's a flush draw available or obviously 6-5 in this example. But you can usually rest assured that such an opponent will not have like three of a kind because they would they instinctively know that checking and trying to get someone else to bet so that they can raise is a better play. So now what your range should look like for donk leading into multiple opponents should be, sure, go ahead and lead out with some of your draws, especially lead out kind of small so you can control the uh, the price that it costs, if you will, to see another card and see if you get there or not. Uh, so you're betting on the come. You want to do it with a small to medium-sized bet, right? 
you should also make the exact same bet with some big hands so that you are properly balanced. So what I mean is if again, if we say, say we have king seven four with two hearts, you should make a bet of about, let's say a little less than half the pot when you have a flush draw or a straight draw, maybe not a gut shot, but an open ender. And then also with all of your sets and maybe if you somehow slow played pocket aces or whatever, and that might be a good range for donk leading. So that way you're you're well balanced and your opponents won't be able to immediately put you on a hand just because you let out. In practice, it's hard to do because when you flop that set, you usually want to check and see if you can trick everybody into putting in some amount of chips that you can then check raise and say, ha ha, I got you. See, I tricked you into betting. And that is kind of everyone's natural instinct, I think, is to slow play the monsters. The problem with that is that when you lead out, now I know that you'd never have a monster and then I can put pressure on your medium strength hands. So you don't want to do that. Now, if you're in a low stakes game and you don't think that your opponents are going that deep as far as trying to figure out who's got what and hand reading, then feel free to exploit them and donk lead however you think will best maximize your profit. The T in GTO stands for theory. And I think that sometimes players are trying so hard to approach GTO perfection that they forget their opponents are human beings who are making lots and lots of mistakes. So you want to know what the uh, theory is, but then also know when and how to deviate from it. So I hope that answers your question, Daniel. I'd love to hear everyone. Please join the discussion on Twitter at Clayton Comic. Let us know whether you have a donk leading range in multi-way pots and how you go about constructing that range yourself. I received another message this week on Twitter, and this one comes from a user, uh, John, and his Twitter handle is John M. Revis. And John wanted to ask, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he wanted to ask me about now that comedy is basically dead, (laughs) at least for the moment, at least where I live, there's no comedy for me to do. So he wanted to know whether that has changed my playing style. As you guys know, if you've listened a lot, you know that I tend to play a go for it style. I, I like to play for first place and I don't focus on ICM and laddering. And so as a result, I don't min cash a lot. And John wanted to know whether the fact that I'm now playing full time, whether that has changed my approach to the game or not. And uh, this, you know, that's a great question. And the short answer is no, but I also want to give the long answer, which is whatever game you're playing, you should be, you should have a bankroll that allows you to play that game to the best of your ability, whatever that means to you. Now, I've admitted very freely on this podcast that I'm not the best poker player in the world, and I don't pretend to be. I've had some success, mostly in the live arena. Uh, I'm kind of learning the online game, like so many of you, as a result of the pandemic. But one thing that's always true when I'm playing poker is I'm not thinking about the money. And I don't need to win. If you need to win, you should not be playing tournaments. The average player cashes about 10% of the time. Well, it kind of depends on the the tournament, right? A lot of these online tournaments now, they're paying like 18 or 20% of the field. So yeah, of course, you're going to cash. The average player is going to cash 18 or 20% of the time, right? That's just by definition. That's what the average player would do. That's what all of us would do if, if the game just involved... Uh, putting your name into a bucket and then 18% of the, of the field got paid, and then we would all get eight, our fair 18%, right? Some players will be extremely tight around the bubble and will cash way more than that. Some players, their whole goal in a tournament is just to make sure that they cash in as many tournaments as possible. And those are the players that I will be bluffing so much on the bubble. Uh, And there are other players like me where I tend to cash a little bit more often than the average player, but not anywhere near as often as I should. I tend to bubble a lot more than the average player because I do play a go for it style. And I generally find that players are mostly too tight on the bubble because they many times misunderstand 
the ICM implications of what's going on and how important that min cash actually is to them. And they might pass up on spots that they theoretically should take. And maybe in some cases they pass on those spots because they do need the money. They don't want to have to reload or they can't afford to reload. Those players are, you know, the old expression, scared money (laughs) doesn't make money, right? So you have to know what stakes you should be playing that you can play comfortably and correctly and not be sweating the outcome. Now, of course, once a year, I play in the $10,000 main event in Vegas. And I mean, to play that tournament, you should have $2 million theoretically, right? (laughs) I mean, depending on your exact risk tolerance there, I have read some people claim that you should have 200 buy-ins for whatever tournament you are playing. So if you have a $2,000 bankroll, you should be playing $10 tournaments online. I don't know. As far as bankroll management, I believe that the harder it would be for you to replace your bankroll, the more protective you should be of that bankroll. So in other words, if you put $200 online, but you actually have $200,000 in the bank, go ahead and splash around with that 200 bucks, you know, play some games you don't know if you want to take shots, what, you know, it's not really going to change your life if you lose that $200. But on the other hand, if you have $25,000 online and $15 in the bank, then you need to protect that bankroll for all it's worth. And by that, I mean, you should be playing low stakes and trying to protect your bankroll while simultaneously growing it. So that's kind of my best answer to that question. At this point, I'm not really sweating the results of the tournaments I'm entering. And so I can play them with the same style I've always used and the same types of strategies. Now, bear in mind, I am trying to improve my own use of ICM and I'm not trying to punt <laughs> uh, you know, right before the bubble as often as I normally do. Uh, but it's hard because I have had a lot of success in my career doing that and playing really wild a loose aggressive style around the bubble, especially in tournaments where I suspect or have determined that my opponents are being overprotective of their right to min cash. So when I sense that's happening, I tend to pounce and I think that is an effective strategy. However, I've been noticing as I've been working a lot in the last several months since the pandemic started, I've been noticing that there are times when I revert to that strategy in spots where I should not and where it is actually correct for me to fold those hands and make sure that I at least min cash. And I'm proud to say I've done good work on that in the last few months. And it is an area of my game, which I have uh, improved. So I'm happy about that. And thank you, John, for your question. And thank you, Daniel, for your comments on Twitter as well. And everybody else. Please feel free to join the discussion at Clayton Comic. We always appreciate it. Now, if you are still looking for a uh, training site, I'm going to recommend tournamentpokeredge.com. We have the best coaches. We have the best pricing. It's just an amazing resource for anyone who wants to improve his or her tournament poker game specifically. You guys know the names I'm talking about. The Assassinato, Alex Fitzgerald. We're talking about Jared Smith, a recent podcast guest. Of course, Casey Jarzebeck, Daryl Jace, Colin Moshman, and of course, my all-time hero, Andrew Brokus. So come join the party for as little as $25 a month at tournamentpokeredge.com. Now let's talk some strategy, okay? I actually received an email Well, actually, a Twitter message from a user named Ben. He's at Clean Break on Twitter. And Ben says, thanks for all the work you're doing on the podcast, which has been a big factor in getting me back into poker and in a more serious way this time. Well, Ben, I really appreciate those kind words. It's always nice to uh, start off your uh, correspondence with a nice compliment to the podcast host. (laughs) So I do appreciate it. 
uh, he directs my attention to a hand that he submitted to the forums on Tournament Poker Edge. We have a number of forums and a lot of the coaches will interact with the players who leave hand histories and give their opinions on decisions and ranges and lines and things like that. So it's a great resource, one of many great resources on the site. And uh, this one really applies to what we were just talking about, about bubble play. So there are 15 players left in a a $109 deep stack event on 888Poker. Now, uh, the user, Ben, is in the UK, so he is allowed to play on 888, the real one, not the one that we get here in New Jersey. (laughs) So uh, 12 places are paid, so we're down to 15, and the hero in the hand, Ben, is the shortest stack in the tournament, though eight players have less than 20 big blinds. So this is a spot that comes up a lot. Like you might technically be 15th out of 15 when 12 get paid, but you're not the only short stack. There are other very short stacks as well. This is one of the dynamics that I refer to when I say that people misunderstand ICM. If you're 15 out of 15 with 12 big blinds like Ben has in this hand, and 14 out of 15 has 48 big blinds or something crazy, you know, you are in serious trouble and you need to take a chance. There is a strong case to be made with several players, eight of the remaining 15 having only 20 big blinds or less. There's a strong case to be made for Ben playing tight and trying to see if he can outlast the other short stacks and make sure he min cashes. Now, let me get into this a little bit deeper because the fact that half the remaining players are short stacks means that there are several players in this tournament that have almost all the chips. That tells you your chances of winning this thing are pretty slim. So that's an argument for trying to ensure the min cash and not just going for broke like I typically would advise. So this is what I mean. ICM isn't so simple and a lot of players do misinterpret what ICM is trying to tell us. So heroes in the big blind with about 12 bigs and the action goes oh well before we talk about the action we have some reads we're going to talk about uh villain number one middle position tight and he's running 15 9 3 so he's v pipping 15 which is pretty darn tight uh nine pre-flop raise and then three percent three bet around 60 hands now 60 hands isn't a lot to go by especially because obviously some of those hands were played on or near the bubble. Uh, But still, absent any additional information about this opponent, we can kind of determine that he or she is a tight player. Villain number two on the button is bad, running 58-12-3. Yeah, that's pretty bad. (laughs) But limping seems to be working for him, says Ben, in this tournament. Uh, As we'll see, the button has about 40 big blinds when half the remaining players have less than 20 bigs. So uh, it also says here that villain number two is also willing to call off light with cards to come, but there's no evidence that he will call preflop shoves light. That's your scenario. Everybody else at the table is playing tight as expected as we're approaching the bubble. We have a king of clubs, 10 of diamonds. So king 10 offsuit in the big blind. And the action is two folds to the middle position, villain number one, that tight player we described before, who min raises to two bigs. Fold, fold to the button, who calls, which doesn't mean a lot because he is a uh, 60% V-pipper. So yeah, he probably calls a lot. And then the small blind folds and the action is on us in the big blind with 12 big blinds holding king 10 off suit. Now, there's a case to be made for just shoving here. You know, there's plenty of chips for us to collect and kind of distance ourselves from the other short stacks that are remaining in the tournament. Uh, But the reason I don't like that play in this particular scenario is that the original Razor in middle position is so tight. I mean, I know we only have 60 hands on him, but he's running 
you know, 15 V pip, it doesn't feel like his opening range from middle position is going to involve a lot of hands that he's going to be willing to fold if we decide to put the pressure on and shove all in here. So it doesn't feel like a good spot to me for a play like that. I mean, it is defensible, but I wouldn't personally do it. I think folding is okay. It feels, you know, it feels a little tight because King 10, two Broadway cards and all that. Uh, obviously, King 10 is, of course, an above average hand. But in this particular spot, so many flops could come that might cause us to go broke because we have such a short stack to begin with. What if we flop a king, right? I mean, are we really going to be able to get away from it? I think, believe it or not, with the dynamics that are present in this tournament, I would just fold king 10 here, even though we're getting, what is it, five and a half to one or something on a call. I just don't want to have to see a flop that I'm probably not going to be able to get away from my hand if I hit the flop. And then I basically award the min cash to one of my other short stacked opponents when that happens. That may seem tight to some of you. And as Jonathan Little said, I guess I am a nit, but this just feels like a spot to be nitty. Chip preservation is so important when you are one of the short stacks. I think in this situation, playing for the min cash is probably correct. And to me, that means just folding pre. Obviously, that's not what our correspondent did in this hand, or it wouldn't be very fun to discuss it. But that is what I would have done in Ben's shoes. So Ben calls. So we're going to see a flop three ways. Uh, we now have about 10 bigs left, and the pot is seven and a half bigs. And the flop comes 10 of hearts, seven of hearts, four of hearts. Okay, so this kind of demonstrates the exact problem that I have with calling pre-flop. We now have a top pair, pair of 10s with a king kicker on an all heart board, and we don't have a heart. So 10, 7, 4, all hearts. We have the king of clubs, 10 of diamonds. This is a great flop for me to just go broke and finish this tournament in 15th place. What I mean is that my hand is a little too strong to fold when I barely have a pot size bet left behind. And this is the kind of scenario I try to stay out of. But here we are, and the action is on us. Uh, is this a spot where you would lead out? I mean, I guess you could. I mean, you could just shove here, maximizing your chances of surviving to the next hand, maybe charging your opponents if they want to call you with an ace of hearts in their hand or whatever. Uh, I think that's fine if you want to play it that way. And it is a multi-way pot, so we do want to have some types of, some kind of a leading out range, right? But I think under the circumstances, I'm still kind of in the mode of wanting to protect what little stack I have left. Now that I just paid the big blind, we can go around the table one more time before I have to do that again. And perhaps a few of my opponents that are also short stacks will go broke and we might be able to squeak into the money. A great outcome would be 12th place for us from here, given that we are 15th out of 15. I really want to go for the min cash here. So I guess I'm going to check and hope that nobody bets. Maybe if it checks through and then a brick hits the turn, I can bet a small amount and hope to take it down. Uh, but yeah, mostly I'm trying to preserve my stack here. And it's just going to be hard to fold when I have king 10 on 10, 7, 4. So that's why I wanted to fold pre actually. But anyway, here we are. We check middle position checks and the button who is that Lucy Goosey player bets 2.47 big blinds into the seven and a half big blind pot. All right. So what to do? Actions on us. I think we can fold. Uh, it might seem nitty and maybe Jonathan Little's right about me. Maybe I'm a closet knit and I espouse all of my uh, loose aggressive virtues here on the podcast. But when I get into these situations, I just tighten up too much. Possibly, but with two opponents, you know, we still have middle position yet to act behind us. Although it's odd for him to not fire a continuation bet on this board if he has something. He is still waiting, so it's possible that he could have a hand to play. We just don't know. Also, a loose passive type of opponent has now bet into two opponents here on the flop, which could indicate a hand stronger than King 10. It's murky at best, and I think that folding 
here is the play. I will feel stupid if we get to the river and it turns out that my King 10 would have won this nice pot where I really could have used these chips. But I prefer not to be in these kind of marginal situations when there's so much value in just throwing my cards away. So that's what I would have done here. I uh, would love to hear what you guys have to say. And now hold on a second while I go and read the results. Ben sent me the results in a separate message, but I haven't looked at them yet. So let's see what happened. Okay, I'm back. And the results of the hand are, so the bet from the button, and then our hero decided to shove all in, which, you know, honestly, I see why, you know, in all likelihood, King 10 is good on 10-7-4. Uh, and of course, accumulating chips at this stage in the tournament would be nice. But for reasons I already gave, I, I don't, I wouldn't have played it this way. But I do understand why Ben took this line. And then the uh, middle position player, the original Razor, folds his hand. And of course, the button calls and shows the Queen of Hearts, Ten of Clubs. So at that point, Ben was actually ahead. But look, he's drawing to. 12 outs here. He's got any queen will give him the lead and any heart would pretty much lock it up, right? Even though we're ahead, we're in basically a coin flip situation with our tournament life on the line, which we could have avoided, but here we are. And now we need to win this coin flip or else we're going to take 15th place in a tournament that we had a decent chance of min cashing if we had just folded before the flop. And well, the way things worked out, it turns out that the uh, opponent did end up making a flush here to beat us. And then, of course, Ben took 15th in this tournament. Now, I don't know. There is, you know, when you get on the bubble, you have to kind of walk this tightrope between wanting to accumulate chips and especially to get out of last place and also kind of weighing the chances that somebody else would bust out before you and award you the min cash. And to me, I always balance that against my likelihood of actually winning the tournament or making the final table and making a deep run. And in this case, it just doesn't seem all that likely. Although nothing is impossible, <laughs> it does feel unlikely enough to me that this is a spot where I would choose to go for the ICM outcome and go for the uh, min cash. Let me know what you guys think. Am I too tight? Am I a nit like Jonathan Little thinks I am? Send me a tweet at Clayton Comic and let me know what you think. And that'll do it for this week's episode. Wish me luck in the circuit events here in New Jersey, Nevada, as I try for my first ever circuit ring on WSOP.com. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, good
Can't read my, can't read my